November of 1313, uh, there are only about three or four English castles left throughout Scotland. Edinburgh Castle, which is taken early in 1314 by Sir Thomas Randolph, uh, Robert Bruce's nephew, um, by Escalade, he jumps over the walls. Roxburgh Castle, which is taken about six to eight weeks before Bannockburn by Sir James Douglas. Supposedly dressed as a herd of Highland cattle. You heard it here first. The guy's an absolute nutter. You've also got um, uh, Bothwell Castle, just outside of Glasgow, in the hands of the Fitzgilbert family, still uh, loyal to the English crown. Dunbar Castle, right down on the border, and Stirling Castle. Now, Stirling Castle is not the castle you see there today. That is a 16th to 18th century Renaissance monstrosity. Now, the castle there in 1314 is very, very basic indeed. We are talking about a timber and earth Norman fortress with a box rampart and a stone gateway. It's a building that, that is absolutely tiny. Within that castle, there is a garrison of about 60 English soldiers, and they are led by one Scots knight, Philip Mowbray. Now, you shouldn't trust Mowbray. Mowbray's wages might be paid by the English crown, but he does have sympathies for the Bruce cause. So he is playing both sides off against each other. He is not to be trusted. Now, Stirling Castle is, of course, important because it overlooks Stirling Bridge. If you can look at the upper portion of Matthew Paris's map right here, you can see that it connects northern and southern Scotland. If you hold the bridge, you hold the castle, you hold the castle, you hold the bridge, hold both of them, you hold the hinges under which Scotland is held. And for any army campaigning in Scotland, that is absolutely vital. Now, in the six weeks before Bannockburn, the castle has been under siege by the Scots army, led by Edward Bruce. Now, that is a picture of the earlier siege back in 1305. Rather, the present siege would have been just across the Forth uh, at Cambus Kenneth Abbey. I don't think it's been marked down in that map right there. Now, the people in the castle know that an English army is not coming north in a month for Sundays. That is just not going to happen. Edward II's priorities, again, are just uh, subjugating the English barons and also pursuing the war in Scotland. His eye is off the ball. Um, and that is really important for the garrison holding out. They just can't. And so they make a deal with Edward Bruce. If Stirling Castle is not relieved by Midsummer's Day of 1314, the castle will automatically fall to the Scots army. Now, when Robert Bruce hears about this deal for Stirling Castle, he's actually not very pleased. Edward Bruce and Robert Bruce's brothers, they actually don't get on. So not much love is being lost there. However, as well as that, Robert Bruce knows that he is not a battlefield commander. He is a guerrilla commander. If he comes and tries to take Stirling Castle, he will also have to fight a pitched battle against any English relieving army that will be forced to come north. Now, if that happens and he loses his battle, well, the possibility of him losing further political support and further control over the English or over the Scots kingship uh, is quite high. Bruce is someone that burns out castles. He attacks supply trains. He raids and trades. He makes a nuisance himself. He does not fight in the open field. However, if he does manage to stand here and fight and win that battle at, ba at Bannockburn, he can now assure himself they'll gain the support of lords, the barons, their men, their money, their resources, their castles, their influence, and all the protection that comes with that, which up until this point, Bruce has had a, a minority in, and he'll never want them ever again. Bruce will be able to start carving up Scotland in his own image will be able to start acting like a medieval king should. So it is a win-lose situation. It could go either way. But Bruce thinks it's the better part of valor to stand here and fight. He moves the Scots army, which numbers anywhere between... Oh, I'm just skipping ahead of myself, I think. He moves the Scots army, which numbers anywhere between six and 10,000 men, from the King's Park area into the New Park and onto Balquiddick Ridge, which is just outside of the New Park, where for the next six to eight weeks, those, the Scots army will train in their battle lines, forming a battle plan and awaiting that English invasion. It is coming sooner or later. Now, 
when Edward II hears about this deal for Stirling Castle, he's actually not very pleased. He's actually not very pleased. Um, and so he decides to muster an army to gather at Berwick for the 1st of June, 1314. Now, he wants to campaign in Scotland anywhere between, uh, anywhere between 30 and 40,000 men. What he actually gets in reality is anywhere between 18 and 24,000. The reason, as I said, is that the major lords he needs on his side, the Lancastrian lords, uh, are again unhappy with his choice of favourites. If they're going to, uh, if he's going to appoint the commoners to his, his uh, to the major positions in the land, they're not wanting to follow those people either. And so that puts Edward II in a bit of a bind. That means he is forced to raise and levy uh, an army. Now, in feudal England, every single county hundred is forced to raise a body of armed men for service on the king's campaigns for maybe 40 to 60 days every single year. Why 40 to 60 days? Because usually after that time, the harvest needs to be brought in as well. Now, if you can't feed the rest of the kingdom, you certainly can't feed the army either. Um, so naturally, you want to keep both sides happy. That's why most medieval military campaigns last that long. However, these men are relatively untrained. They're almost a militia. They'll train for maybe one weekend every single month. Just like the later trained bands moving forward into the 17th century, they'll turn up at a particular spot to train. Uh, they'll wait for everyone else to turn up. Um, so they'll have a bit of a party. And then when everyone has turned up, they're so sozzled, you actually can't do anything with them. So they're a bit useless. So that means that Edward is forced to further bolster his ranks with foreign mercenaries. So when we talk about English army, we're not just talking about Englishmen, there's also Scots, there's Irish, there's Welsh, there's French, Germans, Italians, Swiss, Danes, there's people from Norway, there's people from Spain as well. Something that modern day uh, post-Brexit Britain could certainly learn about. Now certainly looking uh, opposite to their Scots, opposite numbers, Although they don't have, uh, you know, as, as varied nationalities within the Scots army, uh, there is still a range of nationalities there as well. So you've got Scots there, you've got Irish there, you've got some Welsh there, you've got Armen there, you've got some English lords there. Because remember, the English lords on the border have a tendency to switch sides according to which way the wind is blowing. You've also got some Danes, Norwegians and French in there as well. So lots of different numbers as well. So that is the army's. Uh, as they fought. So this army marches north from Berwick and it reaches Falkirk uh, by the evening of Saturday, the 22nd of June, 1314. In the morning, Sunday 23rd, they'll march to 10 miles from Falkirk to Bannockburn, which they'll reach by about half past three in the afternoon. Now, as soon as the English army reaches Stirling, as soon as that English army reaches Stirling, they see they've got a number of obstacles in their way. Firstly, you've got the Bannockburn itself right down there. Now, where you see the, the, the bottleneck just below the new park area, uh, that is the area around Milton Ford. It's about five feet. You could hop across that. That's not an issue. However, if you move upstream uh, just to where the, the trees are along the bottom of the map there, um, that is the Great Ditch. That is a 40-foot ravine. It's steep, it's slippery, it's impassable. You try and cross that, you will fall flat on your face. And I do have first-hand experience from that. Uh, last February, I had to go and do a, a lecture to a local history society uh, on the history of the battle. Now, I thought it was a good idea and the snow and the ice and the wet to go out onto the battlefield, take some new photos to illustrate that talk. Now, I got to the head of the Great Ditch and there's a big stairway that leads all the way down it and in the snow and the ice, I could see trackways leading down. Someone else got down there. I thought, not a problem. I can get down there as well. I managed to fall the full 40 feet from the top to the bottom in the space of about two seconds flat. So I can assure you right now, no medieval army is getting across that ditch easily. So if they can't cross there, they have to move further eastwards. And just where the second set of trees is, uh, just across the burn there, that is the area known as the Cast of Balcuri. It is nasty, horrible, wet ground to this day. However, in the summer, it will bake hard. 
and it is a good campsite. Down there, you've got fresh water, so you can water your horses and your men. That's a good start. You've also got protection on all, four, on all three sides, so your flanks are anchored. The Scots can't get around you. But best of all, that area provides plenty of open ground to properly form an army up. So by all accounts, that's actually not too bad. The big problem is, is that when 24,000 boots are continuously tramped across that ground and churned it up, just like in rugby field, that is going to turn to mud. It will turn to a swamp. It's what we call post-glacial deposits. What's left over from the last ice age? It's really nasty uh, soil. It's soil that has a very low colloid, so it just won't bind together. And indeed, at the time, the Scots knew that area as the Powells. Powells and Old Scots is nasty, horrible, wet holes. And as I said, if that's making up the majority of that karst area, it is very, very hard ground to fight a battle over because you just churn it up anything, it's going to turn to swamp. It's going to turn to a quagmire. So not good ground uh, to be fighting over. Moving northwards, the English army will then have to encounter the Pell Stream burn. Now, running through St. Ninians, that has all but disappeared today. It's retreated underground, but it will slow the English army down. But finally getting over all of those obstacles, the English army is going to be on firm ground on the far side, up on Broom Ridge, give battle to the Scots over in the King's Park, and hopefully relieve Stirling Castle. Now, it sounds simple, but I assure you that it really is. So, it's half past three on the afternoon of Sunday, the 23rd of June, 1314. The English army comes straight up the road, which runs roughly parallel to where the modern M9 uh, is, and they reach Milton Ford. And the first thing they can see, they have a big problem. The Scots on the far side of the Ford have prepared the grounds. They have set up traps. Firstly, what they have done, the first thing they have done is they have dug potholes. They have lifted the turf. They've created divots in the ground uh, so the horse will turn its leg. That is bad enough. What they have also done is they have sown cow troughs. Now, a cow trough is four nails welded together in the center. It looks a bit like a star. Wherever you throw that down, it will always land with a spiky bit pointing upwards. The sole purpose of that is to stab into the soft part of a horse's hoof or a human foot. It's the medieval version of an anti-personnel mine. It's a pretty nasty piece of kit. From someone who has accidentally stepped on one of these, I can tell you it's not something you walk away from easily. So the Scots have sown a couple of hundred of those down there at the ford. Now, what's going to happen if the English army just battles across that ford? They're going to create a big bank holiday pile up on the motorway. It will be carnage there. It will slow them down. And that is not a price they can pay. So most of the English army is going to move off to the east, down onto the cast to camp for the night and hope to give battle later on. However, a small body of English knights does manage to get across those traps. And amongst their number is a 22-year-old knight, Henry de Bouin. Now, he wants to make a name for himself. And at the front of his party, he can see that off in the distance, there is a lone horseman on a pony. Now, he's wearing a yellow surcoat where, uh, with a red lion rampant upon it. It's the personal arms of the kings of Scots. It's Robert Bruce himself. And he's all on his own. Now, it's, now what is Bruce doing there at the front? Is he putting himself at the front to try and go to the English to come across those traps? If that is the case, it has partially worked. However, is it also the case that Bruce has put himself at the front because he doesn't intend to fight a battle at Bannockburn at all? If he can see the English army coming up that Roman road in overwhelming force and he can't defeat them, that allows him to retreat towards Stirling Castle and off into the northwest in Lennox. Now, he has done this previously when he stood on this ground against an English army back in 1310 as well. That time, he's seen the English army are coming up in overwhelming numbers. And that's Adam escaped to the north, heading towards Perth and Inverness. At that time, Edward II has chased after him. has got all the way up to Inverness. Disease has set in. Men are starting to desert, go home. And so Edward II has been forced to go back to Westminster with his tail between his legs. He's got to account for why he hasn't brought the Scots to battle. Now, there's a thousand theories as to why Bruce is there at the front. None of them really adds up. But we do know that he is there 
and the Boon decides he's going to go and take him out. The rest is legend. Henry de Boon gets an axe in the face for his troubles. It ruins his day. Bruce gives him a frontal lobotomy. The only thing that Bruce can say is that he's broken his favourite axe. So first blood for the Scots. Seeing that de Boon has now been killed, his squire tries to race up to save his master's body. He is then unhorsed by the approaching Scots hobelars, and the earls of Hereford and Gloucester have also sent their horse across that ford to try and regain the situation. However, in the process, James Douglas has now started to advance his division, and seeing this, the English army has been forced back, not wanting to take on the Scots. Um, in the process, um, the Earl of Gloucester, who is in that vanguard, is unhorsed, and he's again sent back to the English lines with his tail between his legs. He's embarrassed, and as a result of this, Edward II is gonna turn around to him and call him a fool and a coward for not beating the Scots. Remember this, because it's gonna have a huge effect on what happens on day two. So, first blood to the Scots. Meanwhile, another body of, Scot of English horse has, man un has managed to move down onto the cast uh, under Henry Beaumont, the Earl of Buchan, and Sir Thomas Gray. Now, they're going to see at the top of the rise, in about half a mile away from their position, up near St. Ninian's Church, which is uh, where Little and uh, Stirling Police Station is today, there is a Scots formation completely and utterly unprepared. Now, if those knights charge into that formation and they break it, they will separate Wallop Bruce not only from the rest of his army, but also from Stirling Castle and his retreat route to the northwest as well. They can break the back of the Scots army here and now. So it's all to play for. Those English knights are going to charge in. The reason that formation uh, is unprepared, though, is because its commander is still over with Robert Bruce. His name is Thomas Randolph. Now, he's the Earl of Murray. He's the king's second in command, his nephew, and he's also the captor of Edinburgh Castle. So long and short of it, he knows what he's doing. Now, he is over with Robert Bruce, giving him a telling off for putting himself in danger at the front of his army. However, Bruce turns around to him and he puts him down. He basically tells him to get over himself. A rose has fallen from your chaplet. Get back there, form a defence, make sure those knights do not get through our lines. That is exactly what Randolph decides to do. He forms his men up into Shultram formation. Now, remember that word. Um, because the Scots are going to use a lot of it in the Battle of Bannockburn. But Shulchman, Old Scots, it basically means a thicket, a really thick, thorny, spiky uh, hedge. Now, that's a really good description of what these formations actually would have looked like. Imagine, if you will, a big block of men. There's a 1,000 men in each one, so maybe 1,200. They're in 6 to 12 ranks. That's enough to stop a horse. And each one of them is carrying a 16 to 18 foot long pipe, a big spear. It's basically a human hedgehog used to kill and combat cavalry. Now, a horse is an intelligent beast. It knows not to run onto a sharpened stake. That's not good for anyone's health. The knight on top of that horse, though, is pretty thick. What he's going to try and do is charge into that block of men, get in amongst their ranks, make a big hole, burst them apart, and ride them down. Now, that's exactly how Edward I has managed to beat William Wallace at Falkirk on the 22nd of July, 1298. Now, in the 17 years between Falkirk and Bannockburn, the English army has not learned a better way of breaking up these formations. So once again, those English knights are going to charge in. Don't for a minute, though, think that the Scots are the only ones using the Shultram uh, as a military formation, because we know at exactly the same time uh, as Bruce is fighting his war against the English, that on the continent in 1302, the Flemings are using Shortrams against the French at the Battle of Courtois, the Battle of the Golden Spurs. And indeed, in the same year after Bannockburn, the Swiss have used the uh, Shortram uh, against the Germans at Mortgarten as well. So this is a formation that is diffusing throughout European armies uh, throughout this period. It's not in isolation, just within the Scots army. Those English knights uh, now need to charge in to try and break that formation. Now, Thomas Gray is a bit reticent. He can see the Scots are now starting to form up in their battle formations. Uh, he actually turns around to Henry Beaumont and Robert Clifford 
And he tells them, no, we should hold back, wait till the rest of the English army has arrived, and then we can, we can deal with this short term uh, in, in piecemeal. We can bring up the archers to shoot holes in them, and then we can charge into them. However, Robert Clifford and Henry Beaumont, again, want all the plaudits. They want to be the ones to break that Scots army. They are having none of this, and so they charge straight into that formation. But this time, they cannot find an opening. They spend the next six hours riding around that block of men, kicking up the dust, becoming so frustrated that they throw their lances, their swords, their maces into that formation, trying to break it, but it's no good. The short has held firm. As this is happening, uh, James Douglas has brought up a second short to face off against these Scots knights, uh, against these English knights as well. So there's just no way today they're going to break up this formation. As a result of this, the English knights are then forced back on to the cast where they will camp for the night and hopefully give battle the following day. Squeeze like a can of sardines between the Pell stream to their front, the Bannockburn in their rear, and with the Scots now overlooking them on the Ridgestein as well. So the English army down on the cast is now completely surrounded. That said, though, it can be said that the Scot, that the English knights have stopped the Scots from charging down on the English army as it has marched down onto the pass. The English army is in something called a line of march, which means that as they have come up the Roman road, they put all the fastest troops in the army, the knights on horseback, the men at arms at the front, the infantry, the guys on foot in the middle, and then the baggage train behind it as well. So that English army along that road is stretched out over about 15 miles. They are not traveling anywhere fast. And that's also going to have a huge effect to play on day two of the battle as well. However, have no bones about it, it has been a bad first day for the English army. They have lost two fights. That is bad enough. What is worse is that now within that English camp, the commanders are arguing. Chief amongst those commanders are the leaders of the vanguard, Humphrey de Boon, the Earl of Hereford, and Jobet de Clare, the Earl of Gloucester. Now, Humphrey de Boon is an experienced campaigner. He has five, six campaigns against the French, the Irish, the Welsh, even against Edward II himself. So he knows what he's doing. He's been made Marshal of the English Army. Opposed to him, you have Gilbert de Clare. Now, he's 23 years old. He has absolutely no experience of war whatsoever. However, he is cousin to Edward II. He is one of the richest men in England. And so naturally, Edward has made him Master of the army. So these two commanders are butting heads against each other. There is no clear uh, pyramid of command within that English army. And as a result of this, the Earl of Hereford might tell one unit of soldiers to move to one side of the field. As soon as they get there, the Earl of Gloucester will turn around and say, no, I don't want you over there. Move back to where you were originally. So it means that the organization, the deployment the English army is forced to make down on the cast is completely higgledy-piggledy. It's also back to front as well. The knights have been so used against those Scott shotguns on day one are going to remain at the front, whereas the infantry, the archers, that now need to be brought forward to break up the Scott shotgun formations, they're now stuck at the back. So the English army down there on the cast is now back to front. That said, it has not been a silent night for either army. Round about midnight, um, the Earl of Athol, who has served in the Scots army up until previously, has actually changed sides. He goes over to Canvas Kenneth Abbey, where the Scots camp is, and he burns that camp as well. He kills William Darth, he burns all the Scots tents and their baggage, and he forces the Scots camp followers from Canvas Kenneth Abbey up onto Gillies Hill, which is about 45 minutes walk away from the main area of fighting on the Bannockburn battlefield. That's going to have a huge part to play uh, later on, on day two of the battle. However, as well as that, people are now starting to change sides. And within that English army, there is a young Scots knight. His name is Alexander Seaton. Now, previously, he's actually served under Robert Bruce as his steward for his lands in Yorkshire. So he's a bit of a turncoat. Seaton now decides that it's a good idea to go and change sides. He goes from the English army straight over to Robert Bruce, and he tells him this. If you fight your battle tomorrow, there is no doubt about it, you will win. That English army down there is tired, it is hungry, it is fed up, and it's ready to go home. 
charge down in the morning and I can guarantee that the English army will break and scatter, which is exactly what Robert Bruce decides to do. At 4 a.m. on the 23rd of June, the English army on the 24th of June, the Scots will form up on Balcony Ridge in three big blocks and they will advance down to the mace of that ridge line and they will kneel in prayer. Um, they are taking absolution for what they're about to do. Edward II, waking up to this, turns around to one of his main aides, uh, Gilbert de Umferville, and he says, look, the Scots, they're kneeling for mercy from me. Gilbert de Umferville turns around to Edward and he says, they're asking for mercy, but certainly not from you. They're asking for it from the Almighty for what they're about to do. The Scots then stand up and they do something the English have never seen before. They advance. Previously, at Falkirk and other battles, those short terms have been static, ideal uh, targets for the English archers. Now they are taking the fight to that English army, and the English army has to react to this very, very quickly. Now, remember the Earl of Gloucester has been called a fool and a coward the previous day for not breaking the Scots. He now knows it's his time to shine. Now, in his eagerness to get stuck in, Gloucester's going to jump on his horse without his coat of arms, without his armour, don't try us at home, and he charges straight into the centre of the Scots line, into Edward Bruce's division. Now, initially, he forced them back here on to the dry field, of roughly where Bannockburn High School is today. It buys the English army vital minutes to properly form up. However, in the process, Gloucester is killed, serves them right. However, by doing that, he's now created a big gap on the Scots' left wing. And that allows English archers, who have until this point been stuck at the back of the, or back of the English army, it now gives them a chance to move round the side to the west and shoot two bodies into the Scots' flank. They're chased off, though, by Robert Keith's Scots knights, who rout them from the field. And all this time, the Scots continue pushing forward, stabbing, skewering, slaughtering every single thing in their path with a side order of bludgeoning, stabbing, and slashing. It's carnage down there. Now, by this point, that English line has started to concertina. The back of the army is now trying to spread into the front. The vanguard of the army in the front is trying to spread into the back. Men are running left, right, and center. Any command control now within that English army is basically gone. Um, so complete chaos is now reigning. Now, as a result of this, the English army is slowly being pushed back towards the burn. The English army now seeing that they're not making any forward progress against the Scots whatsoever, they're being attacked from all sides, decide now is the time to cut and run and save the losses. They're going to try and pull back across the burn to the southeast in an orderly fashion to fight another day. However, in the process, they get stuck in a bottleneck in the burn. And in the rush and the crush and the panic to get away, between seven and 8,000 Englishmen are thrown in the burn, crushed under the weight of an armor and drown, so you can walk across the burn without even getting your feet wet on the backs of the dead bodies. It's a human bridge down there. Edward's army is broken, and that is before sunrise. The fighting has bedded us now. Now, amongst those dead, 50 of them have been English knights, whereas 50 English knights have also been captured. So the flower of English chivalry has fallen on the Bannockburn battlefield. Put that into comparison, the Scots have only lost maybe between 200 and 900 men at the very most. Out of that number, only two of them have been knights. It doesn't sound like much but in the grand scheme of things, it has certainly proven a point. Edward II by this point is now in the thick of the fighting. Now, by all accounts, he's had a rather good battle. He doesn't really have a clue what's going on around him. But it is clear to all and sundry, if he stays on the battlefield, he is going to get killed. The Scots are starting to surround him. They're grabbing at his harness and his reins. He will get killed if he stays here. So he's dragged away by his household of 600 knights, led by the Earl of Pembroke, to around here. They stop on his main bodyguard, a 33-year-old knight, Gilles de Argenton, the finest knight in Christendom. He turns around to Edward and he tells him this. Sire, you are now safe. You can get up to Stirling Castle, not a problem. We will cover you. We're expendable. But I have never left the battlefield before in defeat in my life, and I'm not going to start now. I'd be disgraced. And so he, with Edmund Morley, charges straight back into the Scots lines, where you guessed it, he gets killed 
pretty quickly. Brave, certainly, possibly a bit foolhardy, possibly a bit brash, but we are still talking about it 703 years later or 708 years later for the wrong reasons than he intended. We still remember it anyway. So, Edward II, he is now clear to get up to Stirling Castle. At this time, the Scots camp followers have now come down off of Gillies Hill. Whether they get involved in the fighting is very, very debatable indeed. It's about a 45-minute walk between Gillies Hill and the battlefield. Uh, it's in, at about 4 a.m. in the morning. And it's also a case that if you go down onto the battlefield, you actually can't see Gillies Hill. And from Gillies Hill, you can't see the battlefield either. So whether they took part in the fighting or not is open for conjecture. Certainly, we know they come down off that hill, though, after the fighting is finished, and they start to loot the battlefield clean. Uh, we know for a fact that they took about £120,000 in loot. Now, if you put that into today's values uh, with uh, inflation, that comes up to a rate of about, uh, about £120 million uh, today as well. So the Scots army goes home very, very rich men indeed. However, in this lull, Edward II is allowed to escape back up to Stirling Castle. But when he gets there, Philip Mowbray, who I told you not, you shouldn't trust at the beginning, he turns around to Edward and he tells him to get lost. He says this, Stirling Castle is now indefensible. If you come through its gates and it gets captured, you'll be captured and the ransom price will be Scotland and Northern England. It will bankrupt England. That is not a price Edward Carnarvon is willing to pay because if that happens, he, uh, the Scots will bring him to the negotiating table. He will be forced to recognize their independence. And so taking a fast horse, he retreats down the northwest, uh, down the southwest side of the battlefield, chased by about 50 knights led by Sir James Douglas. They pursue him all the way back down the line of the M9, firstly to the Nifco, wherever the second stops, the chronicles say, to relieve himself of water. He basically needed a wee. He's cut short, though, he jumps back on his horse and heads back down to Dunbar, which he reaches by about lunchtime. Dunbar is 60 miles away from Stirling, and he takes a ship from there back to safety in Berwick, leaving a third of his army dead there on the fields of Bannockburn. Now, prisoners at Bannockburn are starting to be taken. Bruce had said at the beginning of the battle that no prisoners were to be taken, no quarter was to be taken. The reason for that is if he took prisoners, that would deprive his, his shotrams of men to take those prisoners to the rear and also to guard them. By depriving his shotrams, that creates holes to which the English cavalry can charge into. It's something he can't afford to do. However, the fighting is now finished and prisoners are there for the taking. It fills up Bruce's coffers. The main prisoner um, that is taken uh, firstly, is a 65-year-old Yorkshire knight, Marmaduke de Twain. Now, he had actually previously captured Robert Bruce in 1302, and he'd given him good service. He'd wined and dined him. He'd given him a really good time while Bruce was prisoner. Bruce now personally takes him prisoner. He turns around to Marmaduke de Twain, and he says, look, you gave me good service back in 1302. I will give you good service now. I will wine. I will dine you. I will have your wounds, uh, wounds cleaned and, and seen to got nothing to worry for. So, uh, Marmaduke de Quen is allowed to return back to his lands in England. The most high profile prisoner taken at Bannockburn though, is Humphrey de Boon, the Earl of Hereford. He escapes with his household back to Bothwell Castle, just outside of Glasgow. He goes there because the Fitzgilbert family up until this point have been sympathetic to the English. He goes to sleep there that night, only to wake up in the morning to find that the Scots army under Edward Bruce is at the castle gates. The ransom price for, uh, for uh, de Bruin uh, will be the return of Bruce's wife, his daughter, his sisters, Isabel and Macduff, they find him at, found him at Schoon in 1306, and also Bishops Wisher and Lamberton that had anointed him uh, in 1306 as well. They had all been taken prisoner as soon as Bruce had seized the throne. However, Hereford is a bit of a big head, turns around to his captors and says, no, I'm worth double that, triple that, raise the ransom price. He does himself out of a rather good deal. But that's the Earl of Hereford for you. That's Bothell Castle right here. In the immediate aftermath to the, uh, to the Battle of Bannockburn, Bruce goes up to Stirling Castle and the first thing he does is he slights it. He tears it down. He undercuts the earthworks. He burns the castle to the ground. 
So it can't be held against them ever again. Stirling Castle before Bannockburn had been besieged six times previous in the first Scots War of Independence. If it held out as a garrison any longer, it's going to be besieged again. And not only that, remember that Bruce's army is small, his war chest is small. If he garrisons that castle, he's got to pay for their upkeep and their food, money that he can't afford. It's far cheaper just to destroy the castle. The most recent uh, expansive set of archaeology done on the battlefield was part of the Bannockburn Big Dig uh, in 2013-2014. I actually worked on that as uh, one of the archaeological supervisors uh, with the Centre for Battlefield Archaeology at the University of Glasgow. Uh, that was with Neil Oliver and uh, Dr Tony Pollard. Now, during that survey work, we uncovered about 3,000 metal detector finds, only three of them identifiable uh, to the 14th century. Most of them were tracks, couplings and fittings. Um, however, we take that data set, um, all the stuff that was unidentifiable over an 800 metre stretch does give us an idea of the extent of the fighting at Bannockburn. However, the three items that we did uncover were all part of horse furniture. We've got a, a stirrup iron, a prick spur, and a copper alloy cross with traces of gold and blue enamel on it, something we call horse furniture. That would have been braided into the horse's mane and bridle. First, is to show that the rich man, that the guy riding that horse is a rich man. You don't want to go and kill him. You want to go and sell him back to his family. But as well as that, when the angel comes to take that knight up to the Perda gates, once he's been killed, the angel knows to take him upstairs rather than down to the hot place down below. Now, three items are never, ever going to make a battlefield. They never will. However, compare them to similar battlefields like Shrewsbury or Barnet that have absolutely no finds whatsoever. It is a start. There's two theories to how they've been deposited. The first is that a knight has ridden along the banks of the, of the burn. The horse has bolted. That's how been lost. That don't, really doesn't make much sense. You've got to remember the horses these knights are riding uh, cost a good king's ransom. That's like taking your top of the range Ferrari down a muddy road. That really doesn't make much sense. So if that doesn't make much sense, the only possible explanation for them can be starting to find archaeological evidence for the English heavy cavalry collapsing on the cast early on the 24th of June, 1314. As well as that, uh, back in 2003, a bodkin arrowhead was found up near the Bannockburn Memorial on Monument Hill. Um, however, the battlefield at Bannockburn is barely a mile away from the Sockyburn battlefield dating to 1488 as well. That arrowhead could quite as easily date to 1488 as it could to 1314. So it's not conclusive evidence for the battlefield either. No mass graves have been found as of yet. There is one account from the Scala Chronicle which says, there might be graves over near Canvas Kenneth Abbey, but that's about three and a half miles away from the fighting and on the far side of the fort. It doesn't really make much sense to transport all those bodies killed during the battle all that distance. It doesn't really make much sense. However, there is one field right next to Bannockburn House, and that's known as the Bloody Folds. That has always been our best guess for a possible mass grave. However, we did extensive geophysical survey on the grounds there in 2013, and we didn't find any evidence or mass earth movement there associated with a grave cut. We've also got to remember that this area did used to flood on the seven yearly cycle. The ground is extremely acidic, so you throw anything like bone, textile, ironwork into it, um, it's going to break down over about 60 to 70 years. Um, so that is not going to survive in the ground. We need to look at uh, battlefields of a similar time period, so places like Towton and Visby to understand what those mass graves uh, would have looked like. Those graves have been uh, deposited under a particular set of deposition circumstances. At Towton, they've been buried into frozen soil. That's kept the bodies articulated, and they've also put a church on top of that. At Visby, um, when the fighting is finished back in the 1360s, it's been a hot summer's day. The bodies that are left on the battlefield, the arm is so out of date, that they've been thrown into the grave cut and the armour has thus kept those bodies articular as well. Those are the exception to the rule though. We don't get that kind of thing in Britain uh, very much. So we can continue looking, uh, but the chances of finding any possible graves associated with Bannockburn uh, are few and far between indeed.